Dr. Carol Charles is an associate professor of sociology at Barrett College. Uh, as a scholar, her research and work concentrate on processes and agencies both in Haitian society and with the, within the Haitian immigrant communities of North, uh, North America. Her academic training and her experiences in transnational networking provide the depth and scope of her scholarships. Dr. Charles's present scholarly work concentrates on three areas of gender, race, class, and, and, and ethnicity as they intersect with immigration processes. Bridging many disciplines, including sociology, anthropology, political science, history, gender, and ethnic studies, her contribution is not only to Haitian studies, but also to the fields of Caribbean and Latin American studies. She's a 2000 to 2001 Fulbright recipient for Haiti. In 2012, she was elected as the president of the Caribbean Studies Association, and in 2017, she served as the president of the Haitian Studies Association, Dr. Carol Charles. <clears throat> I'm going to skip to the other end of the table for Gary Pierre Pierre. Uh, he's a Haitian American multimedia journalist as well as an entrepreneur. He's a former staff reporter at the New York Times. He left the Times in 1999 to launch the Haitian Times, a Brooklyn based English language weekly publication serving the Haitian diaspora. Uh, Gary Pierre Pierre. And here to moderate this evening's conversation is Tane Joaquim. He's a stand-up comedian who has made appearances on Gothop Comedy Live, on Access TV, and on Good Day New York on Fox. He's based in New York City, but was born and raised in Haiti. Taneo has a very laid-back, smooth, and conversational style, and he jokes about race, society's idiosyncrasies, and the inherent contrast between life in Haiti and America. Some people say his humor is smart and eye-opening. He would probably agree with those people. I am one of those people. Uh, give it up for our panel. Take it away. Thank you guys for joining us. It's an honor for me to be moderating this. Uh, and uh, give it up again for those two people that are... It's an honor for me to be with them because clearly you can see the difference. Uh, before we get into this, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. How many people here are actually Haitian? <laughs> okay. It's not Eastern Parkway. Calm down. All right. Uh, how many people have some sort of knowledge of Haitian history? It doesn't have to be deep. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. The, the theme of this is Haitian history, but Haitian history is too vast to cover in like an hour long talk. So what we're gonna do is tie in the parts of American history and Haitian history that matter to this conversation. And we're gonna start at the beginning and I'm gonna open it up to the two of them. And we'll start at the revolution and how that had some sort of impact to American history, mainly the purchase, the Louisiana purchase. So. If one of you could give us a quick summary of the revolution and tie that in with Louisiana. Uh, I, I'm going to shift a little bit uh, since we are looking at the history of the US and the history of Haiti. Right. I want to look at the kind of contradictory relationship and contradictory narrative and contradictory practice since the 1770s and Haiti. Uh, why I do that? Because the idea, I, my argument is that there have been a narrative that became part of the lenses of seeing Haiti and right. seeing Haitians. And it, and it began before in the 19, 18, 1717, uh, because in the 1717, Haiti was one of the most, if not, it was Saint-Domingue, the most prosperous colony in the Americas. That is true indeed. And one of the trade partners of Haiti was the US. And in that sense, uh, so when 1791 happened, right. and 1791 is the slave insurrection, 
uh, something, this, is, this was the beginning of a process of transformation of not only in Haiti, Saint Domingue, Haiti, but also in the world. In, not, in other words, what happened in Haiti, Saint Domingue, Haiti, between 1791 and 1804, has been one of the most important process and political event in the world in terms of democracy, in terms of for what it was. So that as don't forget that Saint Domingue was a slave-based plantation society like the US. And therefore, that event from 1791-1804 uh, will have tremendous impact in the US, particularly since the leadership of the US, the majority are slave owners. Right. So you're going to find, as that, that's why I said it's very contradictory, at the same time, you have relationship, economic relationship with that colony that are very prosperous or very good for the then not yet US, but becoming US. And then you have that, that breaking of that system and what it creates for people that are owners of slaves and of other property. What does that mean? At the same time, you also have that kind of relationship. So it is within that frame that I always look at that relationship over time between Haiti and the US and the narrative that emerged from that time about what is this place called Haiti? What does it represent and what does people in that, that population represent, and we can come back, come up to today, right? When we know that the President of the United States defined this country as a shithole. So just think about that kind of, but I don't want to stay there because I think there are other things <coughs> also that are positive. So for example, the Carter administration and its support of human rights. And even in that period of the revolution, 19th century, John Adams was not a slave owner, was very sympathetic, sympathetic to Haiti and support to Saint Louis too, against the, 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 the English. So I think that's the framework that I will see things. It's not all negative of all positive, but it's a, it's, I would call it a paradox. Right. Gary, do you have anything you'd like to add to that as far as it pertains with the revolution? And uh... Well, needless to say that the Haitian Revolution altered the United States in so many profound ways. Um, it it, it uh, changed it in, in, in the sense that the United States, because of the Haiti's uh, revolution, became paved the way for what it is today because the French, having lost the war, uh, lost their appetite for colonial expansion. Absolutely. And they were, and because of the war, France was indebted. They needed money. Mm-hmm. So they sold uh, the Louisiana territory. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just the state of Louisiana. It was a vast territory. Mm-hmm. It actually overnight doubled the size of yeah. the United States and opened the way for westward expansion. And it is what it is today. So I think... Um, you know, the history of Haiti and the United States is more complex, as mm-hmm. Carol said, uh, in many ways, in much more uh, profound ways than Haitians and Americans mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Would, you, would it be too far to say that Haiti is in some way responsible for the size of the U.S. today? Well, yeah, no, <laughs> because, because, because you have to add Texas. Right. Right? Takes us also add to all that peel, pa, part of the United States that is the But all of that came after Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah, and Texas is big. I mean, yeah. yes, it's double the size of the United States, the Louisiana Purchase, but Texas is a lot. And then don't forget, you also get uh, California, Colorado, all those areas were not, were Hispanic or indigenous people. 
and well, not U.S. So right. you have you have that that whole concept. I always tell my student, where do you think all those Hispanic or Latino immigrants come from? Did they cross the border? And then I said, so what do you do with New Mexico? What do you do <laughs> with California? What do you right. do with Texas? Those places belong to not to either to indigenous people or people of Spanish background, descent. The other thing, Gary, that I think was very important, and I was looking again at that period of time and the impact of the Asian Revolution, uh, particularly from 1791 till 1804, is that this is the first time that you have a refugees crisis in the US. White because, people. But most of those new people coming are white. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, 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 even, even before the Louisiana Purchase, which is still a French colony, so those former owners of slaves of slave, after 1791 began to migrate to the U.S. and came, went to Louisiana, but also went to Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and expand in those different parts of the United States. And there was an issue of what do we do with those refugees? Are we, and someone like Jefferson has a very interesting position saying we have to control and help those former slave owners to, to, contrain, to, to constrain more, more revolt and to control more revolt, but on the other hand, I will suggest, and this was, uh, this is Jefferson, I'm quoting, paraphrasing, I will suggest to those planters and owners to negotiate right. in Haiti because as they did in Jamaica. Yeah, I have a little anecdote about that because as a Haitian, I didn't know this until I came here to college. I had a professor who told me that this is very little known historical fact that uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to Napoleon after the Haitian Revolution and told them, we can't have this in our backyard. I will give you supplies and people. You need to go and take this country back. Mm -hmm. And Napoleon said, we lost too much. We can't do it. <laughs> so that's kind of yeah. how, yeah. But also, too, another point is that the U.S. Revolution directly led to the Haiti's Revolution. And that's what I mean, that the dynamics, the relationship goes both ways in more ways than we understand. Because uh, during these revolutions, England and France were embroiled in a hundred-year war. Uh, War of the Roses. And so there was a lot of proxy battles. And Haiti and the U.S. were proxies. So that's why we have so many Lafayette and, and all these uh, yeah, yeah. French names because uh, the French helped the U.S. And in helping the U.S., they brought their slaves to fight against mm. the British. Mm. And so uh, when these slaves came here and they were fighting for freedom for Americans. They went back to Haiti and said, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? We just fought for freedom for somebody and then we were slaves here and then the rest is history. And, and, and so it, 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 it's fascinating because they learned so much of the warfare tactic that was happening here and they mm -hmm. took it to the French. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it, 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 it's just rich with, with, with contradictions and, and, and history. Uh, that when you see what Carol was alluding to earlier is that then they realize what they've just done because the Brits were supposed to be our allies at that point, mm -hmm. our trading right. partners. But then white solidarity came into play. And, and, and so they realized, listen, wait a minute, we have slavery here and then we, there's a free country of blacks, mm. you know, we can have that. Mm. That country cannot succeed. Mm. And I think a lot of times when we talk about shithole, well, this is where it started. Mm. Right. Haiti never had a chance since the very beginning of its existence. Mm. You know, imagine, you know, basically sometime I say today that, you know, uh, and, and it, a lot of people take it the wrong way, but I'm going to say it here, is that basically imagine Al-Qaeda or ISIS defeating the U.S. Mm. and is a country and took over Syria and they are running Syria. That's how Haiti was viewed. Mm -hmm. These slaves were terrorists mm -hmm. and so right. they should not succeed. And we didn't succeed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, that image of that fear, there is a real fear because 
think about it that period of time, the bulk of the wealth that is being created here is created by slaves in the South, particularly in the South. In other words, whatever the US will become, it is built on the labor of those, the free labor of those people. So when people tell you, go back home, why should they back home? They build this place. Right. So, so in other words, in that other words. That deserves an applause, yes. In, and, and what is home also, right? But the other thing is that there, one, if one go back to that period of time, there is a real fear of slave rebellion and of slave revolt. And uh, someone like there is a, there was attempts in the Uni United States to do to have slaves from slave rebellion, not the scope that you have in the Caribbean, but in Charleston, North Carolina, so, uh, uh, in South yeah, Carolina, South Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina, the church place yeah. exactly uh, was uh, the pastor was one of those guys who organized, and he went, apparently, he went to Haiti. That's one thing. There is another, in 1850, there is this white guy, John Brown, that, uh, that is organizing a slave revolt. And what is interesting, the, in Haiti, the most, in, for a long period of time, the larger uh, street, was named Lalu is John Brown. Still so today, there, Avenue John Brown, uh, yes. Yeah, so there, yeah. Was, there was that kind of transnational uh, relation from that period of time. But one can imagine if you are a slave owner and your wealth depends on the work of slave. Right. You're going to do what? To such an extent, there are states that prevent slave owners to, to, to bring slaves from Haiti. Mm -hmm. and, and in many parts of, of uh, the United States, in southern states, the name Haiti should not be named because people, there is that kind of fear. Yeah. Well, it goes yeah. beyond that. In, in France, if you, if you talk to any, most French people don't know about that period, that, that part of the history because it, it is not taught in school. Yeah, it's silent. They don't talk about it. It is, I mean, again, I can it's just shocking. It was a shocking event, and it's resonating uh, less today. But at the time, it was one of the seminal moments of, of, of that time. Right. And to go back to the idea of uh, contradiction, George Carlin, one of my favorite comedians, has a quote that says, America was founded by a bunch of slave owners who wanted to be free. <laughs> and I love that because in that period of time, you have a bunch of revolutions. You have the U.S., 1776. You have the French Revolution, 1789. And then Haiti starts in 1791. But the only problem with that one was it was the wrong color. Mm. So we couldn't accept that one. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to us being in that state where we are now. Yeah. Uh, and, and I want to add, again, in that contradiction, if you go to Sam uh, in Georgia, uh, Savannah, Savannah there is a, a monument on the, mm, one of the place in, and it's the contribution of Haitian free men and free, f there were no women, but uh, free people, free people of color, free blacks, and uh, that came to participate in the American Revolution. So this is something also where we can see that those type of contradiction yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, to make a quick jump in time, since I feel like we got the basic of the origin story, it's like a superhero, so we got the backstory covered. So now we're going to jump to the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting thing for me because I came here in 2008, so when I would have interactions with regular Americans, most of them don't know that the U.S. occupied Haiti for... 19 years. No, more. Mo I'm, I'm assuming you guys are educated people. You all know this. But Some a lot of people, people don't know this. <laughs> did not know that. So let's jump into that one. How did this come about? And what did it do to Haiti on a structural and financial level? Well, it, it, it started because, uh, again, like I said, after independence, we were isolated. And there was a lot of infighting, a lot of political strife, instability. And so the U.S. was looking for an excuse 
to really tame the situation uh, sounds familiar, right? And so they decided that you know they just couldn't let Haiti. Um, Continue. There was supposedly uh, assassination. There was a succession, rapid succession of, of coups, and 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 it was basically deemed unstable. And then the U.S. felt that it was its duty as a big brother, as a big boy, big neighbor, big bully, and uh, it invaded Haiti. Uh, as you say, they stayed for 19 years. And what they did, which was interesting, because they chose all of these southern generals, really racist redneck types, send them to Haiti. And so they really impose this sort of like uh, 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 reimpose slavery in Haiti during that uh, ostensible uh, mission to restore order. And so that period was, re again, resisted by Haitians. You had the whole Kako movement. You had the uh, Chalmay Peralt up in the Plateau right, Central. Right. And, and, and so, again, Haitians were resisting because one of the things that Americans are going to Find, they realize now, okay, <laughs> Haitians are going to resist. <laughs> it is in our DNA. I mean, we're not going to be uh, occupied. It could be, you try economic blockade, we, 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 don't, we don't care. Because when we, going back a little bit to the last conversation, Haiti was the richest colony in, 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 in the Americas. And our motto was cut the head, burn the houses. And we did that. And, and right. you think about it, you know, that's sort of like who we are as a people. And, and so they try to impose another sort of like uh, brutal occupation, uh, by the way. And, you know, they did some things. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say it was all negative, far from it, because if you look at a lot of the. Um, Infrastructure that was built—it was built during uh, the U.S. occupation, and the palace that dis was destroyed eight years ago was built by the Americans. And there were a lot of other uh, structures. They did some things, but it was—it was, it was a, uh, a very, very uh, traumatic experience for for Haiti and Haitians in general. And I, I will say one thing: that the, Haiti has this distinction of being the only country that was occupied by the U.S. where baseball is not a sport because the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> we said, no, we're not going to take up your damn game. We're going to play our game. And so we did. not And Haitians Great reason. don't. And they try to bring it, believe me. I remember my father telling me when he was a kid about baseball, well, the Americans were playing it, but the Haitians said, no. The Dominicans, which, Republic, which was of, uh, uh, occupied as well, they... Uh, Loved it. I mean, it's a national pastime there. I mean, they have some great players as well. But we refused to because we saw that as a, a, a sign of rebellion. Right. Well, <laughs> that's a very nice angle, but I will, I, I will say... <laughs> Like, I would I'm not say, having this. I, I'm a say, scholar. Yeah, I think it's a little <laughs> bit more complex than that. Uh, the U.S. occupation is not a unique Haitian event. The U.S. is emerging after the Civil War, after the abolition of slavery, as one of the most important global economy. And we're going to see the expansion of the U.S. Mm -hmm. in the Caribbean and in Central America. In other words, the expansion starts in 1901 with Cuba, uh, in fact, with the winning and the acquisition of the colonization of Puerto Rico. So we have to put Haiti in that context of expansion, not only in Haiti, but also in the Dominican Republic, in Cuba, in most, in Nicaragua, in uh, a lot of Central America. Yeah, yeah. So you, can, you have to put it in that global context on what it means, and what it means both politically and economically. One of the key things about Haiti is that Haiti is, even after the Haitian Revolution, the economy of Haiti is controlled by France. And the Germans are also coming into that picture. So one of the most important dimensions of that occupation is the displacement of France and Germany German, the German used to send their boat <coughs> during the whole 19th century to defend the interests of their citizen. Every time that there were a problem in Haiti with one of those uh, people, the German boats will come in, in front of Haiti and force Haitian government to surrender. 
And this is what also happened in Haiti. One of the first Asians that went to Haiti was Citibank. And something happened before 1915. The occupation was 1915, 1934. One of the most important activity or action of the US was to go to Haiti, go to the central bank and seize every single money and brought it to the US. Right. So this is, this is in terms of <coughs> colonial or post-colonial control in that sense. Haiti was the first to, to experience that kind of control. And this, one cannot, at the same time that one could say they did some infrastructure, some, some work, it also meant Haiti is the place where they stay longer. And uh, with a lot of resistance of within Haiti, particularly of people, of peasant, because the Asian bourgeoisie collaborate. Of course, it's in their interest. So it's not, it's not only one way thing, it's also collusion in Haiti. Yeah. And this has been the, the, <laughs> the policy and the politic of those dominant groups in Haiti. Uh, no country cannot, cannot dominate you without some consent. Right. Inside, and we have to recognize that the situation of Haiti is not only the making of imperial power coming and taking over, it has to do also with that collaboration and collusion. Now, I have to say that at one point, after Charles Peralt, some sector of the bourgeoisie did resist, but it was not a military resistance, it was more a political resistance. Right. So in that sense. So I will say that it's, it was uh, the process at this period of time of making the US as the most dominant economy within the world economy. The other thing about the particularity of Haiti was that in contrast to places like Cuba or the Dominican Republic, where the US did massive, massive investment in plantation. In Haiti, what they did, they just create labor. Yeah. So workers from Haiti and from Eastern Caribbean, particularly Antigua, other uh, island, Caribbean English-speaking island, were used as labor go into those own plantation in Cuba and, and DR. So this, I, my, my point is that from that period of time, Haiti became the producer of cheap labor. Right. And this is something that has been, even today, you look at where Haitians are going, they're going to Chile, they're going to Brazil, because the situation in Haiti do not allow people to make a living. So one of the way that you resolve that is through migration. Right. Uh, but just there was, I want to add one thing to what uh, Carol just said, but one of the key th thing that happened and why Haiti became sort of like the laborer is that Haiti missed the Industrial Revolution. During the Industrial Revolution, Haiti was in an embargo. It's very critical. Imagine today. An a nation emerging without knowing mm -hmm. about the internet. Because the rest of the economy is gonna be built upon that. Just like the 20th, 20th century was built upon the, the innovations of the Industrial Revolution. So that's why, and also too, that because we uh, destroy so much, mm -hmm. the Americans who came, they were not gonna invest a lot because there was too much to invest, because Cuba was pristine, nothing happened there for the most part, and, and, and all these other islands were British or uh, French property, and so there were structure there. Unfortunately, in Haiti, there were none, and so they decided to not go to throw good money after bad in their mind, because why should they invest so much in a country that black people were in? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in the interest of the crowd knowing exactly. Just there was one important name that was mentioned twice, 
in, in regards to the American occupation, Charlemagne Pilat. Do you guys know who that is? Would you like to tell them a little bit? Because I feel like that's an important actor in that mm. situation. Well, Peralt uh, is one is a middle class person, by the right. way. It's not poor people. It's it's not a poor. In, in fact, most of the leadership, in most revolution tend to be people that are better off. Right. Because you don't have when you are just surviving, you don't have yeah, time to invest. Have complete revolution. Yeah. So, but that's okay as long yeah. as the leadership can uh, see and coincide with the needs of of the majority of the people. Yeah. But Peral was one of the guy who began to organize uh, a Depends. response, a military response to the occupation. As I said before, there were also other middle class uh, segment or sector of the occupation that, that will become part of that resistance, resistance, but at the beginning is Charlemagne Peral with peasant. Uh, he is in the central. He, he comes from that central part of Haiti, and this is where he began to organize. And the resistance was uh, fearful, fearful, fearful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the most interesting thing, and this is where my gender thing come into picture. The teacher, Peter. Um, some of the first Haitian organization women movement is created right before the end of the occupation, 1934. And the leadership of that occupation, of that women movement organization, the leadership come from that resistance, national bourgeoisie or middle class resistance. In fact, the father of one, one of the leaders is this guy, Sylvain. And he's, he has three daughters and his wife that are at the leadership of the League, which is the first uh, women organization that was created in the country. So you could see the resistance take is really multi-form and multi-dimension. And this is the space where women will use in order to begin to not only to organize, and this is a very interesting period of time and where the, the, the resistance take different forms and the opposition take different forms. Yeah. One of the things I, I think is important for us, for me to point out is that that occupation, uh, one of its worst legacy was the creation of the Haitian army, mm -hmm. which became a brutal tool to oppress mm -hmm. any sort of like uh, intellectual or real or perceived threat to the leaders. So right. it, it was an instrument to destabilize the country, and that was really structured by the mm -hmm. U.S. And, and I think that's very important because a lot of the problems that continued was directly because of this army that the U.S. created in Haiti. Mm -hmm. yeah, they also important. created and, uh, also in, in, in Nicaragua. That's the same model that yeah. they have both yeah. in Nicaragua and in the United States. Yeah, once you have an army, it's easy to control the rest of the country. So I'm glad you brought that up because now that's a perfect segue into our next time jump. So the occupation ends in 1934. So now we jump a little bit. A couple of governments, some unstable. Polo and Maglo was stable for six years. 1957. François Duvalier, no, he Papa didn't want to leave power. <laughs> <laughs> he he made a coup. Me. He literally made a coup and yes. had to be kicked out. Right. And it was the military created yes. by. Yeah, but it's Magloire. So Magloire created that coup. Yeah. In other words, Magloire wasn't. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good point. I need to Google that, yeah. but I, I'll trust you for now. Yeah. No, you don't need to Google it. This, this is a Google right there. You do like my student do. I say, you better get out of my class if you Google. I don't accept any Google because they're contesting what you are teaching them. Right. So that's what you just did. <laughs> well, you're the professor. I don't know if he is, he a, is, professor. A, he is professor a professor. Also. Oh, you are. <laughs> well, I could not tell by your outfit. <laughs> so you mean he's well dressed, professors that are well dressed? <laughs> so 
1957 marks the beginning of a new era. That's Papa Doc. That's somebody that a lot of you know. And with the army, and it's going to last like it's a father and son dictatorship from 1957 that ends in 1986. Yeah. So can we, let's, let's jump into that one, because that's also very important in terms of the mm -hmm. U.S.'s relationship with Haiti. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take it? <laughs> uh, I, I want to say something, and I'm to continue a little bit about gender. 1950, the women, organic, women get the vote, and, yeah. but they are able to exercise it only in the election of 1957. The election of 1957 is a kind of a very important moment because this is the first time that you have direct uh, how do you say voting. In other words, before it was the Senate that will nominate that will it's like here, the electoral college type of thing. But in Haiti for the third you have the direct suffrage. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, so Duvalier, but one of the most interesting about the different candidates of 57 is that uh, Duvalier is not, the people tend to see Duvalier as not popular. But Duvalier is quite popular in many segments of the population, <laughs> particularly the black middle class. The other part of Duvalier is that he has the support of a very large contention of the army. And then he has the support because Duvalier came to the US to get training. University of Michigan. Right. And Duvalier, to, to some extent, has support of some politician or some segment, segment of the US political body. So Duvalier it doesn't come from the sky as and become, he has bad bases. And he's going to shape one of the key things that he's going to do is literally disseminate every opposition. And then he is able to negotiate with the US, for example, in 19, when the US, uh, when they're going to expel Cuba from uh, the, the organization of American state, they get the vote by, from Haiti, the total vote, and what they give in return is the airport. Right. The airport. The airport. airport. The international airport. That, those are the type of things that Duvalier will, huh? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And he knows how to negotiate those things in that sense. but. Uh, one of the key things, the result of Duvalier coming into power is, and this is linked to that immigration, the emergence of those immigration flow, is that most, all the, the, oppos the opposition or the, the candidates that were in opposition to Duvalier came in exile here, with one that was killed inside, but the other one came into exile in the United States. Okay. And, and this, is, this is going to influence a lot the way the immigration community of Haitian saw their stay in the United States. They were, as I call, birds of passage. Mm -hmm. We hear, but we hear only for a period of time because we're going to organize opposition in the United States against the dictatorship. And for the next, up till the 19, uh, 1986, yep. this is the life within the community. Everything is political. Every action and every, particularly in terms of your, the way you see yourself as an immigrant in the United States, is going to be shaped by that kind of objective and dream of going back, even though historically this never happened. You are immigrant, you stay right. where you are. So. Right. <laughs> but this is, this is the type of, and this is going to have a lot of impact in terms of policy of the United States during that period of time of 1957 to 86, 
where you're going to see different positioning and different policy towards Haitian immigrants, towards refugees, and towards the, the dictatorship in Haiti. A key, key uh, actor will be Carter, President Carter. President Carter is going to be one of the most important US uh, partners in that sense to the whole process of Haitian democracy. Because part, uh, the, the agenda of Carter, part of the agenda of Carter was promotion of democratic processes. And Haiti was one of those places that they began to implement and to support the emergence of a democratic movement right. in Haiti. Got it. So I have a slightly different outtake on Duvalier. I think he was not sort of like the army's favorite. The army chose him because they saw in him as a puppet, somebody that they could manipulate. That's why he was picked out of many candidates. Some of them were more qualified than he was to, to, to be president. But they know that they, at least they thought he could right. be manipulated. And so one of the first things he did when he had accumulated enough power was to emasculate the army. Mm -hmm. Basically uh, made them into a, a puppet. He created his own security goons, the Tonton Oh, yeah. And, 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 and uh, terrorized the country uh, uh, and zombified the country because that political fervor that we had was destroyed because uh, wives did not trust husbands and vice versa. It was that kind of thing. Like he created that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of environment led to the migration out because what he did, first of all, he started to give them golden parachutes. Uh, you were Haitian professional. Africa, all over West Africa, Central Africa, were looking for professionals to help run the newly independent nations, and he just sent us by the boatload uh, to Chad, to Benin, to Togo, mm -hmm. to the Congo, everywhere, all these countries to this day. The first card of professionals were Haitians because Duvalier did not want any opposition. Mm -hmm. He got rid of them. Mm -hmm. the, and then later on, uh, sort of like the middle class, the, the working middle class, if you will, came here, Canada, Mm -hmm. Because Duvalier just du got rid of everyone that he deemed was a threat, a threat to his power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> the U.S., by the way, realized what they got in their hands and turned on him. They did, uh, despite the airport deal. What happened is, is, is that the U.S. did not like the way he was going because it was counter to what they were preaching to the world. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they created the Republic of NGOs. They decided right. that they were not going to fund the government because that means they were going to help the value succeeded. So all the aid was going to uh, international organization into Haiti. Again, sounds familiar. Uh, mm. That devolved so much that lives became so tough for the average Haitian. That's when the educated masses came to the U.S. And then we, we settled here. And I was part of that group that came here. Mm -hmm. I came here in 1973 because my, my, my parents didn't want to go to Africa. They stayed. Uh, they were from the South. And he hated the Southerners <laughs> because the Southerners were snobs. They didn't think very highly of him. And he was going to show them. Mm -hmm. And he did. And so... The last, the seminal moment, I'm told, and I, I, I don't remember this, but that my mom was at a, a young lady, was at a party in a casino in the basement there, and this Makut came and asked her to dance. Mm -hmm. And being the rebel that she was, she pushed him away, and she was arrested. And then my parents said, okay, 
This That's is going right. too far. We got to get out of here. And then we left. Yeah. But, right. And we settled yeah. on the Upper West Side. Yeah. Uh, it was not the pretty <laughs> neighborhood that it is today. And to your point, Carol, I remember every day people would gather and plot mm-hmm. the coup against Bob and Bob. We were going to go yeah. back. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that, that was sort of like do, do, what do, we do, were started at really being revolutionaries in the Upper West Side, which, by the way, again, I want to reemphasize, it was not the neighborhood that you think of it today. <laughs> uh, but let's contextualize again. Uh, 1965, immigration policy reform. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, before 1965, immigration policy is based on uh, nationality. In other words, Uh, Most people from 1924, when the U.S. received millions, 24 millions of immigrants between 1880 and 1924, most of them, you know, I call them off-white. They're not white yet. (laughs) Because whiteness is a process. You become white. Uh, (coughs) Between 1880s, turn of the centuries, and 1924, you have immigration policy that are based on quota, and quota based on nationality. 1965, there is a transformation in policy of immigration. So all the people of color that you see, besides African American, who are already here for 300 years, or some people from the Southwest, Uh, the Chicanos, or indigenous people, arrive beginning that policy that open those two people of South Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And this is where most of us from Haiti come from. In other words, immigration is never a pull issue or a push issue. It's also a pull issue. It's push-pull. In other words, I cannot decide I'm coming to the United States without having a policy that allowed me to come. This is the larger context of all those people coming. Now, Because those people, because in the United States, being citizen or being immigrant has always been racialized, the opening doors are going to be different. And particularly for from people like from Haiti who have a different relation and perception of being black. And this has to do with the Asian Revolution. So a lot of time you will see a kind of consent, con, uh, contestation and opposition. But this is only symbolic. Because as an immigrant, meaning as labor, you don't have that kind of power right. to challenge the power that be. So you enter in the labor market in secondary sector. Yeah. Your position in the structure of the society tend to be marginalized. That doesn't mean that there is no successful stories, but for the bulk of those immigrants coming that happen to be black, it's a different and more complex and more difficult process. Yeah. And then you're going to add refugees. You're going to add TPS people. You're going to add all those different groups that are powerless groups. And this is create, that gives the context for your president to say shitholes. Right. Uh, <clears throat> since we're on that, I wanted to move towards like the the perception of Haitians in in the US around that time, the seventies, the eighties, the nineties. Cause I'm lucky I was 
I was born in 89 in Haiti, and I came here in 2008. So I came as a full-grown Haitian. I never went through what it was like to be a Haitian in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Those guys know, but for me, it's a very different situation. Mm -hmm. Quick little thing before we jump into the conversation. When uh, I learned this fact kind of recently, and it kind of made me sad. When AIDS came out as a disease, it was known as 4H, the letter H. It was homosexuals. Hemophiles, and heroin Haitian. abusers, and the last one was Haitians. So you can imagine what that does to the psyche of a people. To but just it also associate. Has you cannot give blood. It's not only psyche, it's right. real, it's objective. There are certain things that you cannot do because of that labeling. I right. mean, it has consequences. Absolutely, real so, life consequences. So I wanted you guys to expand on that perception, the struggle of what it was like to be a Haitian during those times in the U.S.? Well, uh, I was one of those Haitians during that time in the mm-hmm. U.S. Uh, when I came here, it was interesting because uh, very few Americans knew anything about Haitians, frankly. And uh, they used to call us Frenchy. And then we were kind of exotic, uh, sort of like, oh, these black people speaking French. Or right. Because so we're the only Caribbean black people who speak French. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Come on. Well, we're, we're not, not the only. only well, I mean, the main groups, the main groups in the U.S. Like but, Jamaicans, Trinis, and then you have Haitians. We speak French. That's weird. It's a little different. Yeah. Right, from the West Indies, not the small islands. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they just didn't know uh, anything about us. So I remember as a... Elementary, in elementary, elementary school, fighting for people calling me Frenchy, and I'm like, no, I'm not Frenchy, I'm Haitian. <laughs> <laughs> and people, well, Frenchy. So we used to get into fights, argument about being called Frenchy. And ten years later, uh, Haitian became a dirty word, uh, partly because mm. of what uh, uh, Nathaniel has said, but also too. At that time, you know, the mass media is big, mm-hmm. and you have beginning to have the refugee mm-hmm. crisis that Carol mentioned, whereas uh, the boat people phenomenon began. It was mm-hmm. even more than refugee, it was boat people. I remember one uh, incident vividly because I, I did a, a series, the 10 year anniversary of it, where I was nominated for a Pulitzer at the Sun Sentinel, where when that first boat washed ashore. Mm-hmm. It was in uh, South Florida, one mm-hmm. of the richest uh, enclave in Broward County. I mean, needless to say, very white. And then you had it just like Body. hundreds of black bodies washed ashore. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, all of a sudden, the perception of Haitians mm-hmm. changed. It was even before the AIDS thing because the public media. And then um, it just continued to get worse and worse uh, for young Haitians. I mean... Mm-hmm. By that time, I was in college, and so I kind of missed sort of like this childhood banter uh, kind of thing that a lot of people like. Uh, my, my friend and, and, and novelist, Edwige Jantica, has really written very well about that period because she lived through it. Uh, mm-hmm. It was like HBO is another one, Haitian Body Order. Right, <laughs> there right. was so much. I mean, we could go on and on. And, and so it was really traumatic experience. It, being Haitian, you know, nobody wanted to say they were Haitian. In fact, uh, because we live in different neighborhoods, so if you grew up in, in, in a uh, Latino neighborhood, later on you say you Puerto Rican, whatever, you were mm-hmm. everything but Haitian mm-hmm. because it was uh, not something to aspire to be. It was, it was essentially, uh, we were the dredge of, the, uh, of this country in terms of, uh, in terms of hierarchy. Mm-hmm. We were at the bottom of the bottom. And it, it's kind of, again, jarring because we always fancy ourselves as being middle class and learned and, and, and all of that, but there we weren't. And, and, and so we were being marginalized. We marginalized ourselves because I remember when I came back to New York in the early 90s, talking to some community leaders, and I, and I told them, so uh, there's elections coming. Are you going to invite some uh, officials to talk to you? 
they look at me like, really? We can do that? We should mm-hmm. do that? I said, of course you, you should. Because you are uh, paying taxes. You, your kids mm-hmm. are going to school. You need to engage you know, socially, uh, right. politically, and make sure that your voices are being heard and your issues are being addressed adequately. So it's interesting now we got into from there to now where we have mm-hmm. Haitian American elected to office, and, and so we're not shy anymore as much as we used to be. And then, you know, we were talking earlier uh, in, in preparation for this conversation, and there is Haitians before Wycliffe and after Wycliffe. <laughs> because I think Wycliffe changed the game. This is when he was talking about Eastern Parkway, and, you know, right after Wycliffe came out, Eastern Parkway turned into a sea of red and blue. Yeah. We just took it over so much so. We got resented by the organizers because we were taking over their carnival. And of course, being the rebels that we are, we didn't adhere to any other rules. We did whatever we wanted, however we wanted right. it. And we were just jamming. We and loved- because we, we were out. It was just like being out. Right. We've been we're starving out. for so long. We're we the finally closet got so a long. moment. Yeah. Now we're here. So and we're not going to be heard. But, but Gary, what I have to say, uh, when you look at Eastern Parkway as a community, you have to shake your heads because it's like, and organized chaos. <laughs> well, that's another that's story. That's kind of a carnival. You know, and, and it's organized is, chaos. Is, it's organized chaos, and it's good. I mean, it's life. Yeah. I mean, the Haitian band coming, you can see the difference, but on the other hand, it's, it's like Sweet Mickey, or, <laughs> or former president. That's our Trump. Right. No, well, well, there's another place in which we were leading the world. Yeah. We had a Trump before the but, US had a Trump. But the, but the thing was that many times, uh, Mickey, Sweet Mickey, uh, the performer, will be on Eastern Parkway and he will be wearing a tutu. <laughs> So uh, when, when, you know, a tutu is the dancer, ballet dancer class. So I showed that to my class. I was teaching a class on Haiti culture and society. And I showed that before he became president. And they said, my African students said, what? <laughs> is he the candidate? He was a cross-dresser. That's the kind of guy he <laughs> was. was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would wear tongs on stage. And then that guy became well, the still, president he's still of Haiti. He's still doing it, so you, I don't know why he's in the past tense. Yeah, I don't know why I'm saying why. Yeah, he's still around. He's back to it. He completed his mandate, and then now he's back. So, Well, there is a, yeah. there is a joke about the police the, seeing Mickey one, two, three times, and then saying that uh, to stop, to, this is the joke. And because nobody can prove that. And they said to Mickey, you better get down because he's cursing also. He's gyrating. He has his tutu. And then, <laughs> I like how and she then says he's, 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 uh, <laughs> and he's telling things, you know. So the police telling the first time, the next time you're going to go down. And he said, no, no English, no English. <laughs> And then the second time he does this, and the third time the police said, I'm going to bring a Haitian policeman, and I'm going to arrest all of you. <laughs> but it was, it's a joke that people made in Haiti right, in terms of right. how do you control this guy. That is, yeah, and yeah. I mean, just to go back to the Wyclef, uh situation real quick, just how much it speaks to the power of representation in the mm. eyes of the culture, like just to see someone like you being up there. Because I remember when Wycliffe was big and all of us Haitians, Wycliffe was up here, but we're so proud because this is a thing Your that generation. Happened. Your youth. Yeah, yeah. Not, not I mean, me. I, like, why, <laughs> why weren't you proud? Because it's not, I'm not into Wycliffe. I'm well, not, you, I'm well, sorry. I'm not into Wycliffe, and I don't think it's, I don't think that's where I will look for representation and pride. Well, let's I mean, okay. I we mean that's differ- interesting. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be into his music to appreciate what he's done. You well, know what but I mean? what he has done for... No, seriously. Well, well, besides me, yeah. symbols, besides symbols, let's be serious about this. But this, symbols this, are important, aren't well, they? Well, but do they change situation and condition? Well, no, I think not I, really. Here's, here's what I want. Let me weigh in a little so bit. So don't tell me for the majority. We have almost... 800,000 Haitians in the United States. You going to tell me this is a model? 
<laughs> well, what it is is a symbol. It's not. Oh, hold on. Let, let me let me weigh in a little bit because I think uh, Carol is minimizing the psychological and uh, the the cultural impact right. that he had on young people at the time. Because I'm like in the middle here. I'm a little younger than Carol, a little older than him. Right. And, and, <laughs> and, and so I saw it. I saw it uh, uh, yeah, very vividly. I, I lived it. Stop. I mean, in, in, in so a way, negative. it made an impact because it changed the narrative of Haitians. And it also gave young Haitians something to be proud of. And it's not about his music. Pop culture in every society plays a pivotal role, more important role than I as a journalist play right. or as a, someone in academia. A lot of, most young kids don't read. A lot of, they're not in college yet. So pop culture is what really elevates them. Because remember, for the many ways... For African Americans, it was athletes who really turned around when you had blacks into the major league. So, in many ways, oh, come white on. left, come white on. left. Well, it's not come on. No, it, come it, on. It, it, I don't feel yours about this. I'm going no, to have to side no, with going, him on no, this no, one. No, no, no. I'm going to it stop is very you important. because <laughs> if you look at African American history, it's not sport. You have university, black university for 200 years. Yeah, but they were still... I went to a black university. No, I went to but Florida the, you university. You cannot compare. What it is is, is that on. pop culture, sports, these things have immense impact on the society, particularly one that's emerging that feels marginalized. It needs to be accepted by the mainstream, and Wycliffe was accepted, so therefore they felt that they were accepted, we were accepted. I agree with you, it's symb symbolic, but they are important, and then they we were able to build from that. Right. Uh. Human beings live by symbols. Uh. Like, Wycliffe doesn't have to be a politician. What he represented matters.